Hello, this is Ian James Corlett, and you are listening to the GeekCast Radio Network. Super fighting robot, Mega Man. Super fighting robot, Mega Man. Super fighting robot. Welcome to Pixels in the Animation. I am one of your hosts, TFG on Mike. Joining me is TV's Mr. Neil. Hello. And Steve Megatron. Hello. Hello. Uh, in the latest Pixels in the Animation interview, we welcome Mega Man himself, Ian James Corlett. Yay! I'm cheering for myself. Yay! I, I have no Ooh. applause sound effects, so. The sad thing is, I actually put yay in the script in, in favor of Kermit the Frog. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <Hi-ho. laughs> Nice. <laughs> Kermit, you here. I forgot we have two Kermits. Oh, Lord. Uh, so, Ian, how have you been? I've been fantastic. Thanks for asking. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been about six years in a different podcaster. So it was uh, April. Oh, my God. It's almost six years. Almost five years to the day. April 23rd of 2010. <laughs> Holy cow. We, <laughs> is when we interviewed you for our Beast Wars Beast Machines podcast. I so did not plan this, folks. <laughs> kind of cool. Uh, yeah, it it's kind of cool. Um, so for those of you who are listening to Pixels in the Animation, episode 47 through, yeah, 47 or 57 is going to be our Mega Man coverage. And uh, Ian, just to let you know, um, basically Neil and I started Pixels in the Animation, and we basically go through various different video game cartoons. Some we review every single episode of of, of a cartoon; others we don't. Um, we've suffered through Super Mario Brothers Super Show. We've suffered through some other things, and we're finally here, and we're finally in 1994 in Mega Man. Um, so let's catch up with you. What have you been doing lately? What, are there any projects that you're currently working on that maybe people wouldn't get so mad at you if you spilled the beans or anything <laughs> like that? Uh, that is a loaded question, but <laughs> I'm uh, always loaded. So uh, let's see. Um Projects that I've worked on in the last year or so that may or may not be in the public domain mm-hmm. um, did a really fun series called uh, Dr. Dimension Pants, where I played. <laughs> what is that about? Uh, it's Oh, it's really weird. Um, it's about uh, a speaking unicorn. And a kid who finds this pair of pants that gives him uh, not magical powers. Well, they're kind of magical. He, they they can transport them all over the place. And so it's this young kid, his talking uni- unicorn with a weird, oops, sorry, British accent. And uh, and I'm one of the villains. And I just had a blast doing it. It was oh geez, I hit the microphone again. What's the matter with me? <laughs> um, you know, I'm supposed to be a trained professional. Um, anyway, the the character I played is the Cortex, and it's it's hilarious if you get a chance to see it it i don't even think it's uh i think it's running on teletoon in canada and i don't know about where it's uh, playing anywhere else um other shows that i'm i'm uh involved in is ninjago and uh currently i'm known as uh master chen mm-hmm. and there's a storyline that's uh either just completing or unfolding on that. And I'm another character in the upcoming um, series of Ninjago, which I probably can't talk about, but I will say 
it's not Master Chen and it's not Scales. So I'm another guy. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, for for you preschool animation fans, we're doing more Dinosaur Train, and that's always fun because I love Craig uh, Bartlett, the creator of that show. Um, what else? Uh, Pac Man is out there and the and running. We finished that last year. Uh, let's see. Gee. Let's do some IMDb truth or f- true or false here. Ooh, okay. It says, <laughs> it says that you are going to be the voice of Sly Cooper 20 in 2016 Sly Cooper animated film. Is that true or false? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it says. I know. Uh, I know. Now here's the, here's the, uh, the wicked truth of that. Um, okay. I was in recording something for, uh, for Rainmaker. And it was the Ratchet and Clank movie. And I was doing a bunch of uh, supplemental voices and, you know, ton of characters here and there for that. And in the same session, they said, uh, oh, you need to uh, – we want you to, to, to do this other thing. Have a look at this script. I think it was like a day before, and, and I, I read this character. And full disclosure, and I know the fans are going to go, what? They're not going to believe this. I had no idea who Sly Cooper was. None. Zero. No idea. Didn't know it was a, it was a, a pre-existing character. Didn't know it was a giant game. Didn't know there was this huge fan base. I went, Oh, okay. I love that. I I get that guy. I I see what he, who he is, what he is. So I read for it and I get it. And they said, Oh, well, we're going to tack this onto the end of the session, the movie session. And we're, we're doing kind of a, a trailer. Okay, cool. So, I was in there, and I think uh, Lee Tokar and a couple other guys. And uh, we did this this trailer, and I totally forgot about it. And then about six months later, I start seeing this this perkling and bubbling and, and excitement online. Sly Cooper, Sly Cooper, Ian, Sly Cooper. And I, I went, what the heck? What are you talking about? And then I realized what I had done. And... Uh. And it was it is a pretty cool trailer, but whether it has any relevance to the actual movie project, I cannot tell you. And, and it's not because I don't want to tell you. Uh, yeah. It's because I don't know. Um, it seems like they like they were teasing it just to see how much action they could get out of it, and maybe you know a pre-sale or something like that. But I can tell you this: as far as I know. Uh, there's nothing in production. So if they are planning on releasing it in, in 2016, it, sh- it better be happening now, and I don't think it is. But right. that doesn't mean anything. Right. They so might just use someone it. else. Like, oh, you know what? Ian did a great job for that trailer, but uh, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds will sell more tickets. <laughs> so they're almost teasing it a la kind of the Deadpool like animated bit. Yeah. Just to kind of gauge interest. Yep. I that's, think so. That's, that's crazy. I saw it. I thought it was kind of cool. So. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I finally saw the trailer, I went, Oh, that is awesome. I wish I kind of knew that going into it. I would have tried harder. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm sure you try very hard at every session. I you give, always give a... I give a solid 53%. <laughs> come on now well, no that's not, so, that's not true i a- i actually i'm quite well known for uh for my 75 percent rule and it's okay. not that i don't care about projects it's the 75 percent correlate rule is all about self-preservation and if because I, i've seen guys especially with the you know the anime style and action shows I've seen guys that just give and give and give and give and give until literally, uh, and I'm not using that word incorrectly, literally their throat is bleeding and, you know, from all the screaming and battle stuff and everything. And I just go, you guys, and and they're usually younger than me. Some of them aren't. Don't, don't do it. Cap it at 75, you know, push the odd 80, 85 when you really need to scream, but you know, blowing your voice out for for four hours uh, might just screw the rest of your week. So, 
you know, I don't, it's not out of laziness. It's, it's pragmatism. So that's, you can quote me on the, uh, the, the, the 75% rule of Corlett. Yeah, just imagine if it was still the eighties and there were 12 hour Wally Burr sessions, you wouldn't need any anime sessions. Yeah, exactly. It was that kind <laughs> of thing. Just... It, it's exactly that kind of thing. I, I'm I'm happy to say that I don't think I did more than one or two Wally Burr sessions. I guess I just wasn't his kind of guy. I have witnessed the guy in action at a Transformers convention, and Ooh. he actually did that with fans auditioning for the uh, um, uh, script for the fan script. And oh yeah, yeah. They had to tell him to move on because he was dragging on the auditions for too long, trying to get multiple takes out of everyone. Well, that's Wally. <laughs> Um, I also found out, now I, I have not actively watched this series, uh, I probably should at some point, but you are the animated voice of Salem the Cat from Sabrina's Secret, what is it called, uh, uh Sabrina's the Teenage, Secret, your secret, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes, I am, Sabrina's Secret Life, there you go, um, did you have any, um, interaction with um nick bacay before doing it or did they give you a voice sample and say hey this is what he sounded like nope in okay so they just wanted you to give your own take yeah i mean they they did they did reference it mm -hmm. but uh i'm not gonna imitate him <laughs> <laughs> he can imitate me <laughs> no i'm kidding uh, uh no it, it it was it was an opportunity for me to do one of my favorite kinds of voices and it, it i'm basically doing paul lind and uh, i just i love that kind of character and i think what happened which is what happens a lot of the time you'll get a uh you'll get a spec sheet come out with with an audition uh and it says you know we're looking for this kind of voice and here's the reference and here's the you know the guy that did it on tv and uh, and try this, this, or this, and they'll, you know, name off two or three famous voice voices that they kind of think, you know, might fit. And what I try to do because, because I'm a jerk is just ignore all that and go, okay, who is this character? What does he look like? What does he do? And then go, I'm going to do my thing. And what happens is let's let's use a really, really, really broad example. Let's say a, 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 an audition comes out and it says, you know, this is the, the voice of uh, of Thor. And, you know, we're thinking kind of a Schwarzenegger kind of voice. And then you see the copy and the the the. Producers will sit down, they'll hold a casting session, and then they're going to sit down and listen to 50 guys who are all going, blah, 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 I'm like, Arnie, Arnie, listen to me. I can do a better Arnie than you. And and then I come along and go, guess what? I didn't want to do Arnie. And, and you do a voice like this, and they go, boom, that's perfect. It's funny, and it's weird, and it's different. And then you get the role. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That is, that is very awesome. So uh, since we we're talking about video game based cartoons, uh, are you a fan of video games? Have you ever played any? Yes, I have. But you know that that ship sailed for me so long ago. Um, I I never I never embraced it to the to the level that I know that it is in the in the pop culture. I mean. I had, I had like the first Atari uh, video game system in like '79 or whenever it came out. The the sort of wood grained one that had Frogger in it, or or I think I don't even know if it had Frogger, but I know it had Pong. Um, and I so I played all that stuff, and I and I I went through a period up until the mid '90s when I would play. Uh, PC game that was I, I really like sports simulations I was never really into like the role playing or the or the the shooting stuff too much so I would play like NHL 95 and at the time that was an awesome game 
but I but I found that it was just taking me away from other important things. And then we had kids and I went, oh, my goodness, I can't sit there. I, I like I, I couldn't do it as as entertainment. I mean, I was entertained by it, but I, I just felt guilty. I felt really guilty because, you know, my my uh, entertainment vice is is movies. And, you know, if I'm going to do something for two hours, my choice was to, you know, pick a great movie and watch that. Now, having said that, my son, uh, we we were really, really cautious. And this, this is sort of a big, long answer to, to say that I'm not really a gamer. But we were also really, really cautious about getting game consoles uh, when the kids were young because we, you know, we could see what it did to them. Like my son would go over to a friend's house who had, had free access to video games and the guy would come back and his eyes would be swirling around. I mean, he was just like a <laughs> little zombie. So so we were really careful about that. And we didn't get a game system until the Wii. So now you, you're sort of getting the timeline here, right? And yeah. And the Wii made sense because I went, you know what? I can justify this. The kids can play it. They get up off the couch. They're moving around. It's not, it's not as passive as a video game, uh, standard video game system, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of opened the door. And, of course, now we got a PS4, and, and I love driving games. So, you know, we've got Gran Turismo, and i got a steering wheel. And, and I, it actually was funny. Just this week, I went, oh, man, I want to go down and play Gran Turismo on the giant screen. But then I went, oh, no, I've got work to do. So forget <laughs> it. Yeah. So that's kind of my, my feeling on, on video games. I really I, I respect them, and they're just – some of them are so – awesome but i can't personally dive in because i just i don't know i just can't do it okay so i'm not sure if that was the really what you asked <laughs> <laughs> no it was that's what i asked okay okay all right uh getting into some kind of mega man questions since mega man was two years before beast wars was it kind of uh was it kind of different or, or interesting reuniting with most of the Beast Wars cast for that show? Yeah, I mean, you know, voice acting in Vancouver, as it is in L.A., is a fairly, you know, the people who are doing it at the top, are. it's a fairly narrow uh, pool. So you end up seeing many of the same faces a lot. And it, it was the weirdest thing about um, about Mega Man was that I did the voice of Dr. Wily back in the Nintendo days. And then Scotty McNeil comes in and he's playing Dr. Wily. And I'm going, well, just why don't you just do the voice I did? I used to really bug him about that. <laughs> uh, hey, just uh, here, Scott. This is the way you do it. And then I would, and then I would do my old Wiley, and he would act like he was mad, and and then we would fake fight and all of that stuff. But but it, it was a similar kind of group um, that ended up doing Beast Wars, uh, and I, you know, it it is it is kind of neat. It's it's sort of I've always referred to it a little bit like family, but I don't mean like. You know, brothers and sisters. It's sort of like cousins and uncles and aunts, some of which who are weird. And you go, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, we're going to have that family thing. Oh, I wonder if so-and-so is going to be there. Oh, oh, that should be good. So it, it's like fun, weird family. <laughs> and I mean that with the utmost respect. <laughs> yeah, because I mean almost everybody – most of everybody was in Mega Man that showed up in Beast Wars. There was you, there was Gary, there was Scotty. Um, I think. Who else? Uh, I know David wasn't there. Um, was, I Alec, Venus... was Alec Willows? I don't think Alec Willows. I, no, I don't remember Alec doing a voice on it. <clears throat> but, uh, alright. As far as getting the role of Mega Man, was it just a normal audition or was it something that like your agent may have pointed out to you or well you know interestingly enough um it's really only been the last 
handful of years that I've had an agent. Oh. Um, the, the scene here was so odd, the way it developed, that I didn't, I didn't have one and I didn't really need one. Because uh, the history of, of Vancouver voice uh, grew out of commercials. So it was kind of a tight-knit voice community that did commercials. And when the, when the animation work started coming to Vancouver, they the companies went to the people who cast commercials. And the way it was done here was, you know, there was kind of a list and you know, if you got onto that list, that A list, you would just get phoned and uh, hey, we, we got a we got a commercial that's for McDonald's and we need a we need a young guy, an old guy, and a guy who sounds like he's from England. You know, oh okay, well I know what I'll do. I'll I'll phone uh, I'll phone uh, Gary uh, Bill Ryder and we'll get that Ian Corlett guy, that kind of thing. And and you would just you'd show up and do the do the work. So when the animation work came in. That was really my first taste of auditioning because uh, mm -hmm. there wasn't a whole lot of auditioning before that. And it's an anomaly. I, this is not the way Hollywood works. It's not the way Toronto works even. Um, but in Vancouver, that is the way it worked for, for quite a period of time. It's totally different now. And mm -hmm. every, everything is auditioned for, which actually is a little annoying because there's some you know tiny commercial jobs that, you should just get a phone call and just okay, let's get so and so. Get him in. It's going to be great. We're going to put those people together, and it'll be hilarious. And but it doesn't work that way anymore. So, um, to answer your question, sorry, I sort of went around the <laughs> horn of uh, South America and back again. But uh, it it was a, a quote unquote normal uh, audition, but I was very aware of Mega Man because it was it was very uh, popular. I mean, it was not something that was that was kind of oh that's kind of fringy or I haven't heard of that. Like it, to be honest, Beast Wars was a little bit uh, less. I don't, I don't want to say important, but I felt like oh they're they're redoing Transformers that old cartoon. Oh, that's interesting, and I I really did not understand. That there was a giant fan base for Transformers, uh, mm -hmm. but I did know that Mega Man was really popular. So it it, it might have been a little bit the opposite, where I, I felt like, oh wow, Mega Man, that would be cool because that's a character that everyone knows. Um, and and when Beast Wars came up, I don't even think when I initially read it that I that I knew that it was connected to Transformers because it was animals and you know. Sometimes, mm. sometimes I'm not paying attention, right? Come on now, <laughs> give yourself a little bit more credit than that. I will. Come on, I will. But but I'm I'm saying my my very initial oh Beast Wars oh okay it's a bunch of animals and then they're interplanetary and oh interesting, and then the light bulb kind of came out oh 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 okay I get it this is Transformers, but I did not realize, uh, and because remember this is. This is in the early days of the interwebs. So it's not like like you could really plug into, oh, what's the fan base like for this? It would have been, you know, magazines and and uh, you know, maybe some some online presence, but not not huge. Whereas Mega Man was, oh, I know what Mega Man is. Uh, that that's still kind of happening. So that was mm -hmm. the difference for me between the two. Very cool, very cool. Um, <clears throat> was did you did you audition for any other roles on the series that you were not didn't end up getting or anything like that? Oh yeah, every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do. You you want to uh, you want to hedge your bets, right? Because right, I mean, if if every voice actor said, "I know the character I want to be, and I'm going to read for that one." You wouldn't get many roles. So, uh, I, I mean, I can't tell you which which ones, but I because there was a billion of them, right? There was Cut Man and mm -hmm. Fart Man and Booger Man and <laughs> Robo Man. No, I, you know, I'm kidding because you guys know all yeah. of them. But oh yeah, I, I read I I read for all of them, and when I found out I was shortlisted or you know cast, 
as Mega Man and his dog, Ruff. That was fantastic. I just went, that'll score. Yeah, Rush is awesome. I love Rush. <laughs> yeah, I like doing him. Oh, man. It's it's so funny. Um, you were also Snake Man on that series, so you were both a hero and a villain. Yes, that's the best. <laughs> and the, and the, the most fun. Oh, yeah, you know what? That made me th- uh, That made me think of something. A show that's coming out. Um, it's not even on the air in Canada yet. It's called um, Pirate Express. It's kind of a weird title, but the I do two characters. That's what made me think of it. I play Poseidon, mm-hmm. King of the Seas, and his mm-hmm. assistant Gordon. And uh, they're they're it's a comedy, so it's not like one's a hero and one's a villain, but they're very different guys, and they talk to each other a ton. So that was really fun to do last year because I I'm, I would do like pages of dialogue where it's the two of me two of me talking to each other and so uh, basically you had your own frank welker moment yeah a little bit yeah yeah and then there was uh there was a couple of episodes where i played poseidon's nephew as well so i had i had a three-way going if you know what i mean (laughs) that's what we call it in the voice business Uh, scott mcneil moment doesn't happen very often (laughs) yeah no not usually not these days uh, had you ever played any of the Mega Man games before going into the role or anything? I, I mean, I know we've already established that you said you're not a gamer, but you know, did you I, ever look at any of them or anything like that? No, I, honestly, I, I I know it's not doesn't make for a very good story, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I but I I was well aware of it in the in pop culture, like well aware. I just mm-hmm. didn't um, I didn't partake. What were those voice sessions like? Oh, <laughs> those are pretty funny. They were pretty fun. Um, that was it. That we recorded those at, at Ocean Studios, and I mean, there was that was insane. There was like a a real fun group that that you know, if two or three of us were on each show, which often we were, it was like kindergarten. It was just insane. You know, like every time uh, you, you're probably aware, you know, when we record a show, you'll do a scene and it'll be, mm. you know, maybe two and a half pages long. And lots of people are involved in the dialogue and and you read it sort of like you would a a, a, a classic radio play. So it's it's pretty much live and everyone's playing their part. And then at the end of the scene, it's like, OK, cut. And then the producers discuss what they liked, what they didn't like, and then you're going to get some notes, and and we're going to take it again, or we're going to, you know, maybe record individual lines, one or two of them again. But in those breaks, there would be, <laughs> we, we were, it was in the early days of paper recycling, so there was a, a box of uh, of paper that was, you know, old scripts and stuff, and as soon as that that button would go down. Okay, good. Thanks. Hang on. And we knew we had between 15 and 30 seconds where, you know, the people in the other room were going to be talking about something didn't involve us. And it, a paper war would break out. We, you, <laughs> everyone would grab a piece of paper, you know, ball it up as tight as you could and huck it, wing it at the heads of whoever else was in the room. While <laughs> while trying to avoid the microphones, so to this day, oh yeah, and there was also paper airplanes involved. So you know, just to add some added danger to try and poke someone's eye out. But <laughs> to this day, if you go into that studio and look up, they have these hanging. Um, it's like a baffle that that hangs, you know, four feet down from. Is the the ceilings are really tall, so they have mm. these baffles that hang up, hang down, and they're suspended. So it's it's like a, a four by four uh, piece of of uh, wood frame with fabric stretched around it to kind of absorb reflections of sound. So those th- there's three or four of those things hanging from the ceiling, and if you look up, you will see paper up there. Like it, there's <laughs> there's still paper hanging over because no one no one's gonna climb up and clean up there, or well maybe they should, right. but. 
not at ocean. Um, and it's the funniest thing when I, when I go back in there, I look up, oh yeah, it's still there. Isn't that weird? <laughs> How many so, times did you get one in on Gary or Scott? <laughs> oh, loads. loads. Gary, Gary is, was the most fun to torture because he dished it out. Um, and, you know, Gary's one of those guys, he's a classic performer, right? When, when he's on, he's on, and he, he likes to hold court. And he, you know, he commands the room, and when he's talking, he's the only one talking. But it's so easy to get under his skin because, you know, un- unless someone stops him, he just goes and goes and goes and goes. And then I'm going to tell you about this, and then I'm going to tell you this, and then I'm going to tell you that, and then I'm going to tell you... And it's all very funny to to us, and we would we would always subvert him. I, I I had a great in the day. I had a great Gary Chalk impersonation, and would and would uh, basically parrot most of what he would say just to get the other actors laughing. And then and then Gary, you know, he was not so full of himself that he didn't realize what was going on, and he would eventually just laugh his head off with us. So <clears throat> so oh, and he's a but- renowned. He's pretty gassy too. Oh <laughs> yeah, we know. We yeah, I think that's, that's that kind of that's well known in folklore, isn't it? Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> so, do you you really enjoy recording ensemble with other actors, or do you or do you prefer or do you love more you know being in the booth by yourself, doing all the voices, talking to yourself, or? Uh, um, you know what? I'll take it. I'll take it either way. Because if if the cast is fun and clicking and you know everyone's everyone's tuned in, it's pretty cool. Um, but having said that, I love getting the work done. I really love. It was sort of like school, right? Like I used to sit in school and go, "Oh my goodness." There is so much time being wasted. If if I could just get this done, I could, you know, cover this course in a month. And I'm I haven't changed much. So when I when it's a show that, you know, maybe is a little bit less fun, I just love getting a call and going, Oh, you know what? Um we couldn't make the schedule work out, so we're gonna bring you in. Uh, Tuesday morning, and uh, I can get through. I can be in and out in record time, and it's. I'm not. Well, yeah, sure. I am patting myself on the back. There, I'm, I'm saying because <laughs> because I I get it. I've I've done it for a long time. I I I know what's what's happening in the script, and and you know, I can bang off three versions of every line, and uh, one of those three, the director is going to go. Oh, great. Moving on. So I do the next three. Great. Moving on. So I like that. But it's also really fun when it's a great group of, of uh, people in the cast. And, and more often than not, it is a good group. So, you know, how's that for a hedgy kind of waffly answer? I like, I, I like both. Perfect. Now, I heard you mention Paul Lynn's name earlier, and I love Paul Lynn. I love old character actors like that, like Jack Benny and all those guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, are those your influences? Uh, who are your influences, by the way? Well, my uh, number one voice influence uh, is not Mel Blanc, because that's the go-to answer for absolutely everyone. Yes. Um, and I, maybe I'm doing this just to prove that that – that I was really into voices way before there was ever a notion of doing voices for a living or, or the work coming to Vancouver. Um, it was Dawes Butler and Dawes Butler did lots and lots of cartoon work, but I knew him from uh, did, 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 Stan Freeberg and yes. Stan Freeberg was a, was a, you know, kind of a, uh, Today he'd be like a hipster uh, comedian, and they did these these radio style shows, uh, com- comedy stuff, and it was really funny. And we used to listen to it when we would go on family road trips. It was old. I mean, it was really old when we were listening to it. But I just remember, you know, like Saint George and the Dragon, 
And uh, and there was there was this guy, this one guy, and it was Dawes Butler. And he in St. George and the Dragon, you can look it up. It's it, it was a parody of the old TV radio show called Dragnet. And they did Dragon Net. So it was St. George. It was a procedural. It was a police procedural. And and uh, and these two detectives are looking for this fire breathing dragon. And at one point in the in the sketch, uh, they knock on the door, you know, and the guy answers, hello. And he says, sir, I understand you've seen a dragon. Yeah. And who wh what's your occupation? I'm a knave. And his this was Dawes Butler. And I just want I love that guy's voices because I guess I, I maybe I was a little kid, but I felt like I maybe I sounded like him. So he was like a huge influence on me just in the style of comedic voices. Um, and of course, yeah, um, Mel Blanc was huge, but I, I'm a I'm kind of a. I'm like a climate denier. It's it's like, yeah, he was fantastic. But, you know, when you get right down to it and it's not not taking anything away from Mel because he was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But if you closed your eyes and you didn't watch the cartoon, so many of those voices are so similar. But he was so good at just giving a little twist and a little nuance that that and that's where the acting comes into it right that's the it's not doing a funny voice it's it's the it's the actual character of a voice that mel blank was so good at so you know i i guess yeah i i, I want to say my influence is someone other than you know the the godfather of all of us which was mel um and it was Dawes butler but there's lots of guys lots and lots of guys that that I really look up to and really respect. And, you know, Frank Welker is another one that's just, he's, he's kind of like, he's like on a, on another plane. Uh, and there are some guys, uh, there's some younger guys too, that are, are similar to him in that they just kind of, they inhabit and they have these, these really odd, almost sound effect kind of voices that they do and th those guys are are you know really exceptional my my thing is is comedy and realism and mm -hmm. it's surprising actually the the amount of projects now where big funny characters are not really what they're looking for um th and that's going to change i mean it's it's like fashion you know but uh, so I don't get a chance to do really big, stupid characters that often. But I did in uh, in Doctor Dimension Pants in Pirate Express. So I guess maybe that's why I like those ones too. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I have to bring this up since I don't know when we'll have you back on the show. This isn't necessarily related to Mega Man, but since you were the father, I have to ask: Is Johnny Test really over with? Oh, good question. <laughs> you don't know, do you? I don't. <laughs> I don't. You know, and it, and and it's not like I. Um, you know, when when we finished episode uh, of the last season, which was season, I can't I don't even remember now. What is it? Seven, six, six. Yeah, Scott. Uh, fellows and company were saying, "Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. We're doing more. We just uh, just trying to figure out the financing and the scheme and the this and the that." The da -ba -ba -de -be. And that was like three years ago. Yeah. And and I thought, oh, okay. Well, in the summer, oh, that'll be good if that comes back because uh, I don't have a lot else going on. So that would be great. And nothing. And then more nothing. And then some more nothing. So. Your guess is as good as mine. How old are your kids now? Really old. They're 43. Like, oh, come on. Now. No, you're not. That's you're, true. You're, you are nowhere near that. No, come on now. You are true. You are correct. <laughs> um, my son, Philip, is uh, 17. Okay. And Miss Claire is 15. Every time I watch an episode of Johnny Test and I hear... Johnny's dad, always yelling. I imagine that that's the voice you use to yell at your kids. Yeah, and, and you would imagine 
pretty much correctly. <laughs> Except, As a fan, I have to say that would be amazingly awesome to, <laughs> to witness. <laughs> I, I do. I usually when I'm not very serious, mm-hmm. I will drop into. I'm not doing Hugh Test. I I, right. I just kind of drop into that kind of voice because that's my yeah. that's my go to kind of dorky dad voice. Yeah. But uh, but I will. There, there's another one. Uh, there's another one I do when I'm calling Claire. Her middle name is Margaret. And uh, do you guys watch or are you familiar with Little Britain? I've heard of it. I don't think I've seen it. Oh, very absurd, uh, very popular uh, British comedy. And there's a there's one sketch. Anyway, I won't go into the sketch. If you look it up. There's a there's a library sketch, mm-hmm. and uh, it's the most ridiculous thing. A guy comes in, and the sketch is repeated several times. There's there's about five versions of it, but the guy comes into a tiny little bookstore and he asks for the most ridiculous titles, of you know so specific that there wouldn't even be a book written on this, and the little shopkeeper always leans back, and calls his wife Margaret. Margaret, and you hear a voice from beyond, kind of uh, responding to him. Do we have a book on something? And and sure enough, they do. So I mean, that's that's the joke of the thing. But it's a long way to tell the story that when I'm calling Claire, I will often drop into that voice and use her middle name and just call Margaret, Margaret. <laughs> so it is a it is a common occurrence around these parts. That's that's awesome. <laughs> Um, Neil, you had one other question you wanted to ask? Well, it's not so much a question. It's more of me just kind of geeking out when I checked out his IMDb because I'm scrolling down and I see Captain N, Cap, Cap Candy, Dragon Ball, of course, all these like, like uh, you know, all these roles that we know. And then I landed on this one that's got to be one of my favorite movies of all time, and you're probably going to cringe when I say this. It's Project Echo 2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which I I geeked out so hard because I'm like, oh, my God, he played this character that basically stole the whole movie. And I I just remember laughing so hard. I know this is not really a question. It's just like it's more me just kind of like bowing <laughs> for you just because I love I love the whole series. But that movie just cracked me up. Well, thank you. I'm going to have to go back and look that one up because I, I know I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, I, but you know, and this is this is the the reality of, you know, when you work, you you do a lot of stuff, and I remember I remember the title, I remember the era, but honestly, I don't remember the the character or anything. So I I, I should go back and uh, and and see what what you responded to because it sounds great. I'd love to. Yeah, basically, you play the father of this bratty girl basically it's kind of a take on uh on superhero sort of the the main character is it's slightly implied that she's the daughter of superman and wonder woman but your character is kind of an analog to uh to lex luther i guess mm. and you're just kind of this bombastic um i guess i can say uh asshole but <laughs> he's so funny and i it, he's his daughter is like this big, uh, she's like a, a, a genius mech designer and he steals her, her, uh, designs and makes his own mech. And it's, it, the ending is just bizarre and wonderful. And it's, it's a funny movie. Cool. Yeah. And it's supposed to be funny. Oh yeah. Just checking. Yeah. <laughs> Cause some yeah, things it's... are, you know, some, some projects are, are inadvertently funny. But that that was not the case with this one. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the girls in the uh, in the in the in the show was like, uh, it was basically Ken Shiro from uh, from uh, Fist of the North Star in a, in a dress, basically. Oh, That's, nice. Yeah, it's just it's yeah, it was one of the funniest. But yeah, that's that's basically all, all I had, Mike. It wasn't really a question. <laughs> that's quite all right. You're fair enough. Yeah. Steve. So, 
if you could have the chance to go back to any franchise or, or series, whether it's like a newer rendition of it uh, nowadays, uh, to play any role, what would you kind of choose to do? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, hmm. Ooh, you may have stumped the panel. <laughs> uh, my, you know, the the easy answer would be uh, no. I don't want to. Yeah, uh, maybe Sonic the Hedgehog, because I really enjoyed doing coconuts. It, <laughs> it was just a fun character, and it, it was one of those moments in time where uh, you know I, I touched on this earlier, where I was talking about the kind of voices that mm -hmm. I love doing. And that one was one that I had in my back pocket and wanted so badly to find a, a show that it would work in. And, and Coconuts fulfilled that. So plus it was really fun working with Phil Hayes and Gary Chalk because they're nuts. <laughs> but so the part show. of it is, is the work environment, you know, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know there there ah just trying to think there are shows that just plain like flat out made me laugh when i was doing them and i i'm drawing a blank i'm absolutely drawing a blank so let's go with sonic the hedgehog awesome awesome one final off the wall question here before we let you go um and I'm going to go back to something we already talked about. Sure. Do you make as many meatloafs meat loaves as Hugh does? <laughs> no. That's a really easy answer. <laughs> um, and as a matter of fact, I, I can probably count on two hands the number of meatloafs I have been personally responsible for. That was, a, that was a, an in, pure invention of the demented mind of Scott Fellows. So awesome. Uh, so would you like to inform the people where they can interact with you online? Uh, I have uh, have a website that gets uh, updated infrequently, and we're really proud of that. Uh, <laughs> at, if you need uh, a new webmaster, I can recommend somebody. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not even about that. It's uh, like, oh, I have to tell someone what I'm up to. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, it's, you know, it's no excuse. But anyway, ianjamescorlett.com, I-A-N-J-A-M-E-S-C-O-R-L-E-T-T.com. There's, um, you know, there's stuff there. It's not, it's not always uh, right up to date, but you can email me through that. Um, I should be, you know, listing, hey, I'm going to be at the so-and-so con at the so-and-so, but I don't even do that. But I will say on this uh, on this um, podcast, I don't know when it's going to come out, but um, on the weekend of uh, April 3rd, my daughter and I are going to be in San Francisco at BabsCon, which is Bronies – no, Bay Area Bronies Con. So it's uh, My Little Pony convention. Yeah, because you were a voice on Friendship is Magic. I right? was, yes. Finally. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean, finally? Well, I was begging <laughs> and, and whining and complaining because my daughter's getting all this love from all <laughs> these bronies. And I'm going, I got to get on that show. That's the biggest freaking show that's come on in the last, come out of Vancouver in the last five years. And I didn't even get a sniff. Wah! So here I am, wah! I'm complaining. I'm standing outside DHX. And wah! Give me a job. Because that's what I do. That's what works. Um, and then finally, <laughs> no, it's, it's not the way it works. Not at all. But uh, no, and finally, they the, uh, the right character came up. I just, I don't know, I just, just didn't hit the hit the first uh, the first major casting. So this character came up, and I got to do a song, and uh, and then I can accompany 
Claire on these uh, these show tours because you know she's got to go with an adult anyway, so it's kind of a twofer. They get me for nothing. I feel like a real a real addendum to uh, to her. It's like oh yeah, and then uh, her dad. We'll pick on him. Yeah. So there's here's Claire. Yeah. Oh Claire, you're the greatest. Yeah, you're the way. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. And then her dad. Uh, huh? Who? <laughs> and then oh, wait, there's guys Lord. like you. This actually, this was really funny. This is about two two years ago. One of the first things we ever did. Uh, it was down in Seattle, so the whole family went down because it's not that far. And I'm being, you know, Mr. Chaperone guy. Like that's what you do when you're when you've got a child actor and they're at a convention. Mm-hmm. Either either my wife or myself have to be there with her. So um, we're we're backstage at. In, in a, I guess they call it a green room or something, and it's full of super fans, right? Like y- you guys know, right? What, yeah, you know, fandom. There, there's a, there's a type, right? And and they're swarming around, and and mostly they're fans of My Little Pony, but a lot of these guys are sure they're fans of My Little Pony, and they and they identify as bronies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they're cartoon fans and they're anime fans and they're, I mean, they're just fans. And I, this, it was the weirdest thing. So I'm kind of sitting a table away as, as my daughter's getting interviewed by someone. And this, these were VIPs. This is like the VIP area. So, you know, anyone who was back in this room was, you know, had a reason to be there. It wasn't like general public kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I'm keeping a really low profile because, you know, what kind of a dorky dad would I be if I if I hovered over my daughter and went, hey, by the way, let's talk about me. You know, like that would be really stupid. So so I'm keeping a super low profile. I'm watching and I and I see her. I can't hear what she's saying, but whoever she's inter- being interviewed by, I you know, she's talking to them and then the guy's head turns and he looks over at me and she's nodding and going blah, 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 blah. And then points. And the guy looks over again. He, he looks at me and I go, okay, I realize they're looking at me now. I wonder what that's all about. And then he leans over and tells some guy that he's with as of his, as of that. And he points over at me and, and it literally went through the whole room. And I went, what the heck is going on? And, and then Claire calls me over. She goes, Dad, come here, come here, come here. So I go over and I meet the guy. And, and he goes, y- you were Goku? And I said, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. And then, and then someone runs and gets another guy. And suddenly there's, there's 10 people, like, just swarming me. And, or more, actually. There's probably more than that. And it culminated in this one young guy who was the nicest guy but he comes over and I, he is visibly shaking. And I went, hi, because they introduced me to him as Brad or something. And I said, hi. And he goes, ha, 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 ha. I can't, I can't, I can't believe, I can't believe I'm talking to Goku. And he's sweating and shaking. And I'm going, relax, relax, man. It's like, yeah, I'm happy to meet you. And then someone says, oh, yeah, and he was Cheetor. And I thought the guy was going to faint. <laughs> so so that's why it's kind of fun for me to go to these things because it's all about Claire but mm-hmm. there there's a there is a segment of the fandom that just goes oh my gosh that's Claire's dad and you know they do the lineage right so mm-hmm. it's really fun yeah. it's really fun yeah. that was kind of like me 5 years ago when we first interviewed you I remember off air when we first picked up the call, I was like, "Holy crap, he sounds just like Chior." Not, <laughs> not th- well, it was one of those things where I'm, I'm not really like I wasn't sure because I never talked to you before. I hadn't seen any interviews with you or anything online, and I know your Chior voice, you know, immediately as soon as you know, as soon as I hear it on Beast Wars or even the darker version for Beast Machines, and you know. You know, you take someone like Gary. Gary's normal. Gary Chalk's normal voice is not as deep, right, as Optimus Primal's. It's not as deep as Gutsman or anything like that. Sure. And I'm thinking, okay, well, Ian's normal voice has to be somewhat different than. And I'm like, 
holy crap, Cheetor just said hello to me. Holy crap, what the hell? <laughs> and that's, like, that's oh why I, I felt like it was such a score when I got yeah. that thing, because I went, <laughs> I'm just doing me. This is great. <laughs> and and, and I, I'll tell you why. I'm, like, I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm serious, because then I go, oh, this is fantastic, because there's my, my baseline voice. Now I can do other characters in this show. And the, you know, the sky's the limit because I haven't used up one of my good ones or my, my weird ones, even though it didn't really happen. I, I think I was the, I, I might've been a, a ship computer. You were Sentinel. Yes. I was Sentinel. Thank you. I, I remember there was a name attached to it and I was racking my brain and I, but I don't think I got a chance to do much else than that. So, you know, I was all happy for nothing. Mm. Well, I mean, if you and, and I think I mentioned this in the interview five years ago. If you and I know we're supposed to be talking about video game cartoons here, people, but come on, um, you know, if you look at Cheetor's evolution, he goes from being like a young kid yeah, to yeah. a teenager to an adult. So, even though you're doing essentially the same type of voice, you're changing the tones as the character ages. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I, I got to admit, and and that was one of the few shows that we knew going into it that there was yeah. going to be this arc. We did not know that there was going to be a Beast Machines, but but right. we knew that there was going to be a, a, a clear uh, progression in this mm-hmm. guy. Like he was going to start out young, cocky, impetuous, and then eventually, you know, kind of become heroic. I didn't, excuse me, I didn't know how um, mm-hmm. that was going to, unfold but um it did and it was it was great it was you know it felt like acting mm, absolutely all right well any other thoughts from the panel anything else you guys want to say before we close this out not that i can think of now ditto okay <laughs> all right well, we'd like to thank uh, Ian for joining us. Uh, coming up next on Pixels in the Animation, we're going to get to episode 55 and 56, uh, which is more Mega Man reviews. Um, who knows who we'll get next? Maybe we'll get um, maybe we'll get Mega Man's little energy buddy Eddie on this show. Been trying to do that for six years. Uh, um, <laughs> the elusive <laughs> Eddie. Oh yeah, you have no idea. <laughs> I met him at TFCon a couple years ago. Yeah, you should have hogtied him and brought him back home with you. I tried. (laughs) All right, folks. Thank you again so much, Ian. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get out of here. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode of Pixels in the Animation. Thanks, everyone. It's always a pleasure. This is Mega Man, and you're listening to Pixels in the Animation. Pixels in the Animation.